salatu wa salam ala ashraf al-anbiyai wal mursalin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in amma ba'd ayyuh al-ikhwah fa nas'alullah ta'ala an yaghfir lana dhunubana wa yukithir anna sayyiatina nas'aluhu bi'ilman nafi' wa rizqan wasi' wa alihi natawakkal wa ilayhi al-masir ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم. Praise be to Allah. We praise Him. We seek His forgiveness, guidance, and His mercy. We send peace and prayers on His final messenger, Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And we ask Allah for accepting of our efforts, and we pray to Him to give us. Useful knowledge and understanding, beneficial and wide sustenance, and that is we are on him. Him we utterly depend, and to him is the return and the goal. Glory be to him. Um, there is no power and might except that of Allah. And this, after sending peace and prayers on his final message, Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, has recommenced from where we left off last week which was at the last stages of Ghazwatul Hunayn wa Thaqif. If you remember last time, we were at the stage actually, if I remember correctly, finishing with the battle, the Prophet Sallallahu leaving uh, Banu Thaqif in Ta'if, which, they, uh, which was well guarded, I mentioned last time to you, and a lot of injured Sahaba on the Prophet side from the firing, shooting of the arrows from the the, the fortress at Ta'if. Some people left and embraced Islam, especially from the, the slaves. An announcement was made to them, if they leave, then they will be given freedom. So some of the slaves actually left from uh, Ta'if. One of them who left and embraced Islam was Abu Bakr, who I mentioned last time, uh, Thaqafi. But um, the Prophet um, finished with, he didn't continue. There's nothing authentic. Some reports in Sira mentioned he took advice from one of the companions who said, Ya Rasulullah, it's like a fox that's gone in, gone in its hole. And it will stay there, so we may as well leave it rather than getting meaning more injuries and they're not going to come out. So hopefully there won't be any more problem for us. No, no immediate attack from them. Uh, and, and so the Prophet broke the siege of the fortress and some Sahaba suggesting Ya Rasulullah make dua against the Banu Thaqif. So the Prophet made dua for them instead. And this is the way of the Messenger of Allah. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sent as a rahmah to the whole of the world, the creation. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Oh Allah, guide Banu Thaqif. And in some reports, it mentions it, in Sira uh, reports anyway, that bring them to me. Which is what actually happened in the end. And we'll come to that in a moment. So the Prophet ﷺ, uh, returned back to uh, Jirana. This is a place where all the booty, the ghanima, after the of Hawazin, the captives and the animals and all the wealth had been kept till the Prophet came back finishing with the war and the Prophet as I said to you last time it was mentioned he waited 10 days and nights and the reason why it's mentioned that he waited 10 days and nights is so hoping that these people who have been scattered everywhere will come back make a peace treaty not necessarily become Muslims uh, make peace treaty and Prophet Sallallahu was willing to give back the stuff but after waiting 10 days a night there was nothing so Prophet Sallallahu distributed the wealth you can't just sit there all the time you have to go back to Medina uh, so the Prophet Sallallahu decided to distribute the wealth the animals etc and the captives from the women and children after he'd done that and when we talk about well let's finish with this side the many of the people from uh, Hawazin 
Not all of them. We don't have any reports, so all of them turned, came. But many of them came, and they embraced Islam at the hands of the Messenger of Allah. So the Prophet ﷺ said, look, I waited all this time. Now, I'll give you a choice, though. You can either have the wealth back, or you can have your women and children back. So they said, we'll take the women and children captives. So the Prophet ﷺ, even though he's distributed already and given, he said to the Sahaba, your brothers have come now requesting, they've embraced Islam, so I'm requesting you. And if anybody loses out, we will compensate them. But they all willingly, all the Sahaba, the Hadith mentioned that, which are authentic, they returned back the women and children, back to their families. Alhamdulillah. So that was the issue of captives at, uh, after Hawazin, actually. No captive was taken in the end. They were all given back. Uh, nobody was taken as slave from the women and children. It is mentioned in some reports that amongst, because one of the tribes which was a sub uh, section of Hawazin was Banu Bakr. Banu Bakr was a tribe of Halima. Halima was the foster mother of Rasulullah Sallallahu Remember when he was sent as a child to Banu Bakr Sa'ad, Halima took him. This was her tribe and his foster sister Halima's daughter was called Shema so some reports mention and they're okay they're weak but very weak in regards to Halima being still alive and that she came at this juncture as well and the Prophet and was amongst the captives and Shema his foster sister was amongst the captives that those reports are less weak it's possible very likely that it happened and the Prophet welcomed his foster sister, put his cloak out and she sat and, and uh, he freed her and she was, went back to her people. Um, the ones about his foster mother are not so uh, authentic. Um, it's possible. But they were freed and sent. So we have nothing really strong in regards to evidence for that. But these people were all, you know, they embraced Islam and they were left. You know, they weren't, as I said before, they weren't taken captive. Uh, from the Ghanima, as I mentioned to you last time, that uh, Ghanima, according to the Sharia, is that which is taken after warfare by the, the ruler, the state, and one fifth is for the state to distribute. Yeah. It says the Quran says Allah is messenger, which means the state here, not for him personally. Yeah. So Allah in messenger means to the authority and to distribute. And the rest was given to the people who were involved in the fighting by the state. Now the Prophet also distributed. Um, uh, but another term which is used is al-fay. Al-fay I mentioned last time is that which is gathered without war. Yeah. That which without actually war breaking out that comes to the to the hands of but it can be during warfare, etc. That is purely left with the government to decide how it distributes for the benefit of its people. Because fighters weren't involved in it, that's the reason for that. Uh, in regards to the fifth, Allah SWT mentions that in uh, Surah Al-Anfal, the Surah al Badr. Um, I'm not saying this was a suburb of Nazul, it's not directly and absolutely clear that it was mentioned at this time. The Prophet some distributes according to this, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah 41 of uh, uh, verse 41 of Surah number 8, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَعْلَمُوا أَنَّمَا غَنِمْتُمْ مِنْ شَيْءٍ فَإِنَّ لِلَّهِ خُمُسَهُ وَلِلرَّسُولِ وَلِذِي الْقُرْبَى وَلِذِي الْقُرْبَى وَالْيَتَامَى وَالْمَسَاكِينِ وَابْنَ السَّبِيلِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ آمَنْتُمْ بِاللَّهِ وَمَا وَمَا أَنْزَلْنَا عَلَى عَبْدِنَا يَوْمَ الْفُرْقَانِ يَوْمَ الْتَقَى الْجَمْعَانِ وَاللَّهُ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٌ Know that one fifth of the spoils, that's Ghanima, that you obtain belongs to Allah and to the Messenger and to the near kin. This is to um, uh, uh, Qurba, the, the uh, 
uh, the near kin, the orphans, and the needy, and the wayfarer. So these are the sort of categories that the government is going to distribute. Uh, this you must observe if you truly believe in Allah and in what we sent down on our slave on the day when the true when the true was distinguished from the false, or the truth was distinguished from the the, the day of Furqan. I just mentioned that to you. That was referring to Badr. Yeah, so the ayah relates to that and is describing distribution. So it's very likely ayah was revealed earlier, but that was the basis again of the distribution of the ghanima, the booty that was taken. Wallahu ala kulli shayin qadir. Surely uh, for Allah is, has power over all things. So this is the ayah to do with uh, the, the distribution. Now, the distribution is interesting, and a few things we learn from that. Prophet ﷺ and Hadith Bukhari Muslim mention a hadith to do with the distribution as well. You'll find them there. That the Prophet ﷺ, the same hadith that actually mentioned the battle of, uh, uh, of Hawazin. And remember, last time I mentioned to you that when the battle turned against the believers, the Prophet is calling out, isn't he? Call out the lances, but who did he especially call out? The Ansar. Yeah? And that's mentioned in the Hadith for a reason. And I mentioned it the last time. Remember this part. So Ansar come from the le right and Ansar come from the left. And that's when the battle the saying, Labbaik Ya Rasulullah, Labbaik. We're here, O Messenger of Allah. Yeah? Receive glad tidings, Ya Rasulullah. We're here. We're here for, for Allah's Messenger to fight, to give their lives. And the battle turns. So in the same Hadith mentions then about the distribution of the wealth. And why is that significant? The Prophet ﷺ gave like 100 camels after 100 camels after 100 camels to Safwan ibn Umayyah, for example. Safwan ibn Umayyah was one of the ones who was supposed to be killed even on Fatu Makkah, but was given uh, uh, forgiveness. Was not because he embraced Islam, but somebody interjected on his behalf. And I told you last time. Uh, he'd run away and he came back. So he was... Uh, his killing by the Prophet was cancelled yeah. because he was still he was an open arch enemy still that's why he was he was uh, running away in that but anyway he's being given now he didn't even really involve in the fighting because he's still a disbeliever actually still a disbeliever so Prophet now when it comes to giving 300 camels for him as an enormous amount Abu Sufyan and his family were given 100 camels here and there some reports mention for his, him and his family. Abu Sufyan became a believer and perhaps uh, at this is a time and junk, a juncture that perhaps Muawiyah also, we know him became a believer before this battle as well. Yeah. So Muawiyah is one of the sons and others, they're, they're all being given from the wealth. And others like Suhail ibn Amr. Suhail was Mushrik who was involved in the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. Yeah. In the unfair treaty, but he is being given. So, um, while this distribution is going on also, authentic hadith in Bukhari Muslim mention that a man comes, Ata Rajul, Rajul Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Bil Ja'rana, Munsarifa hu min hunayn wa fi thawbi bilal fidda. Well, this hadith in Muslim that mentions that. But the main thing to uh, mention is a man comes from the Arabs. An Arab man comes and he's watching this distribution. Yeah. And the Prophet وسلم, giving to people. Faqal. And he says, This man. Ya Muhammad, e'dil. He says, e'dil, be just. For you have not been just. In some reports. So the Prophet Sallallahu in some reports mention becomes very angry with something. A, a believer saying this to the Messenger of Allah. Be, he is supposed to be a believer now. He's not Mushrik. Yeah. Adil, be just. That you be not being just. And the Prophet Sallallahu Wailaka wa man ya'dil. Wa man ya'dilu idha lam akun a'dil. Laqad khibta wa khasirta illam akun a'dil. 
Prophet ﷺ said, Woe to you! Woe to you! Who's going to be just if I'm not just? Who's going to be just if I'm not just? Indeed, you would be miserable and a, 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 a be destroyed and a loser if I was not just. Yeah. If I was not just. And in one report, he says, فَقَالْ شَقَيْتَ إِلَّمْ أَعْدِلْ You'd be miserable if I wasn't just. Umar bin Khattab radiallahu an, he said, Ya Rasulullah, give me permission, I'll cut the head of this munafiq. Because he said something, I mean, this is, what he said is evident of a munafiq. Yeah. So in this case, you can understand Umar saying, Ya Rasulullah, give me, uh, let me kill this munafiq, this hypocrite. How dare he say this to you? It's the messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. On the wahi, answering to Allah, if he's, that's why he says, if I'm not going to be just, who's going to be just? Who's come to teach you about justice? Who brings the, the, the kitab, which is full of justice? And that's the message that's being given. That's most important. Yeah. So saying to him, be just, you're not being just. Now, the will have been So, in fact, then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said something very interesting, which is mentioned in Ahadith in Bukhari Muslim. And I mentioned these in uh, khutbah before in, in, uh, in Jum'ah as well. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, after stopping Umar from doing, de, uh, killing him, Ma'ad Allah, the Messenger of Allah said, I seek refuge in Allah. Umar, don't do this. And yatahaddath an-nasu anni aktulu sahabi. The people will say that I go around killing my companions. I don't want you to do that. He said, however, in the wa ashabahu, for surely him and the likes of him, and in one report he said, people will come from the like of him from his progeny. Yeah. Or in other reports, like him. What will they be like? Yakra'un al Quran. They will recite the Quran, but the Quran, meaning its meaning, will not go beyond this. Will not go beyond the recital. It will not sink in the heart and affect the rest of them. And what does that mean? And other, other riwayat, in Bukhari Muslim again, he said more than that. He said, uh, You look down on your salah compared to their salah. These kind of people. Yeah. Who's so harsh, this person, that he's, even though he's received Islam, he's judging the messenger of Allah with Islam as though he was guilty. That's, that's the kind of people these are. Yeah. So harsh. So the Messenger of Allah also said, you, Sahaba, will look down, and, and believers, will look down on your, recite, uh, on your recital, uh, on, your, on your prayers, on your salah, compared to their salah. Musalli, oh, their salah will be like, you think, MashaAllah, look at the long salah, so much khushu that appears, you know. They're even doing extra salah, they do long salah. Tahkiruna salatakum ma salatihim. And you look down on your fasting compared to their fasting. MashaAllah, always fasting. This and that and everything, extra fasting. Yeah. And your recital compared to their recital. Always oh, reciting Quran, MashaAllah, I'm just like nothing compared to this person. Yeah. And then he said, they will recite and the recital will not go beyond this. What does that mean? They will go through the deen and come out at the other end like an arrow goes through its target, the animal, and come out at the other end. And one of the hadith explains what he's saying, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's saying, and when the shooter of the arrow looks at the arrow, he finds neither in its piercing part in the head, neither in its feathers, nor along its length, anywhere, any sign that the arrow has been through its target, 
through the animal. What would you find? Blood and stain on it. You find nothing on the arrow. The Prophet says, the shooter finds nothing on the arrow, as though it never actually hit the target. But it did. It went through the target. So what does it mean? They will go through the deen, and the deen will have not made any effect on them. You understand what he's saying, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? So Quran reciting, prayers, blah, 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 yeah? And they come out, and they're going through it, pew, pew, other end. The deen's actually not made any difference to them. Despite all the Quran, despite all the fasting, despite all the prayers, but these kind of people are not those who are like, don't practice anything. These are kind of harsh people. And then, some of the Bukhari Muslim, the Sahaba says, that he described some of them and their leader amongst them. And that Sahabi said, I was with Ali, radiallahu an, when he was Amir, when he was Khalif. And Ali fought these people. And amongst them, I saw this man that the Prophet have described. His description fitted him perfectly. Who did he fight? He fought the Khawarij. Ali, Ali radiallahu an, fought the Khawarij. These were... Yeah, he was the first of those who showed his ugly head at the time of Rasulullah and Prophet warned about these people coming in the times of fitan. Not only Ali's time, any time there's turmoil and turbulence going on, these type of people will turn up. And we have them today as well. He's described them, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, perfectly. Yeah. But not in good terms, despite, now you see, despite Salah, Despite the, the fasting and praying and recital of Quran, these people, in one riwayah, the Sahabi reports it said, they, were, they are the dogs of fire, the dogs of Jahannam. They will be the dogs of hellfire. So, this, these ahadith were related to the distribution of booty at Hunayn. I wanted to link that to you, that this is where you'll find that they are also linked with the occasion where first the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned. There are other reports about these kind of people as well, but especially Muhammad Muslim come at this juncture because of this man coming saying, be just to the Messenger of Allah, you're not being just. Now, beyond that, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and this is mentioned in a hadith again, Bukhari Muslim, hears from murmurings negative from the Ansar. Now, it doesn't mean all Ansar. When you hear, when you see that, it's mentioning in general because there's no specific names being mentioned. So when the Hadith mentions Ansar were saying this, yeah, it's because no specific names are being mentioned. It means people from the Ansar were saying this. What were they saying? Oh, look, when it comes to fighting and giving life, we get, we get the forefront. Look what happened even in, in this battle. Same hadith mentioning this. And when it comes to giving out booty, and look how much booty, he gives it to his own people, the Quraysh. Gives to the own people, the Quraysh. Look how you know, wealth affects people and tests people, doesn't it? He gives to his own people, not only to his own people, but the ones we, who are the leaders of hatred who've been fighting us and their blood hasn't even dried off and been cleaned of our swords yet. Yeah? Abu Sufyan, Suhail ibn Amr, Umayya, uh, uh, Safwan ibn Umayya, the, the most hated ones. Yeah? Their blood hasn't even dried off. Look what he's doing. That's not, can't be right. That's what's being suggested. Others are thinking as well, when making those comments, he's giving to his people, Quraysh, now that Makkah's, he's back, Fatu Makkah's happened, right? And he's showing this endearment to his people. We're gonna, he's, he's not going to come back to Medina with us. So for some, that's what's bugging them. For others, it is that material thing that's bugging them from the Ansar. And, and by the way, I'll come back to the Ansar. When uh, uh, Safwan ibn Umayyah has been given, 100 camel after 100 camel, he got 300. He said it affected him. Generosity affected him. Yeah, Did it? He became a believer in the end. Yeah. Now, sometimes belief comes in because of material seeing. 
but real belief comes later. Okay? So he said, on that day, before the distribution, even though the Prophet has forgiven him, he hasn't become Muslim, but he's Prophet has cancelled the, the death penalty for him. He says, on that day of Hunayn, the Prophet of God was the most hated person for me. Still. And after he distributed to me, he was the most beloved person to me. Couldn't believe the generosity. And he thought, you know, look at what I've been like. This man, for him, he's decided this man cannot be just... <laughs> he's never seen anybody like that. He's from Quraysh. The generosity must be something to do with godliness. And, the general, and that affected him. So him becoming the most beloved person to him means he must believe he's a messenger of God. So he did affect. Somebody asked me why did the Prophet of God give all this wealth to the Quraysh? Uh, uh, you know, it's like bribery. That's what the question was. You bribing them. So here comes the question of from Zakah. And in this case, in this as well, there's a category called Mu'allaf Qulub. Mu'allaf Qulubahum. To win the hearts. Win the hearts. And I say to you, that doesn't mean I say to make them Muslim. Mu'allaf Qulub is used from booty and from zakah to make peace with enemies. You make a financial deal so that you make a peace deal from the threats of enemies. Not necessarily winning the heart means that they'll become Muslim. Okay? So it's not a bribery in, in any sense. They don't have to. You could give wealth for winning the hearts of people. Yeah? And that's the idea that their threat disappears for the Muslim. And they, you give them, and because they don't come Muslim, you don't take the wealth back and say, oh, give us it back now because you didn't become Muslim, do you? Where <laughs> came like that? So it's not bribery in that sense. Bribery would mean that you say, I'll give you this if you become Muslim. That's not Mu'allaf <laughs> Kulubam. Okay? So that's the answer to that. It wasn't for that. Yeah. But it helped towards them, that generosity. Yeah. It helped them. It removed the hatred and the enmity. And then in the end, the, if they wanted to be sincere, Allah guided them. And that's how we see that. So, the Prophet ﷺ, when he hears about the Ansar and these murmurings, he asks them to be gathered in a tent. He wants to speak to them, only the Ansar. And this is uh, uh, the truth of the Ansar coming out and the beautiful character of Rasulullah ﷺ. And their love for him and his love for them, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the Messenger of Allah, after gathering them, and this is mentioned in Bukhari Muslim Hadith and he mentioned Ibn Hisham as well. So Ibn Hisham has also been corroborated as it's so close to the, the Hadith, it's basically accepted. So the Prophet Sallallahu Rasulullah Rasulullah So the Messenger of Allah came once they're all gathered in this big tent. فَحَمِدَ اللَّهُ وَأَثْنَى عَلَيْهِ بِمَا هُوَ أَهْلَى So after praising Allah and glorifying Him, ثم قال صلى الله عليه وسلم يا معشر الأنصار أو oh, people of أنصار ما قالت ما قالت بلغتني عنكم وجدا وجدتموها علي في أنفسكم the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he says after gathering them He said, I have been told, what is this yeah, that has come to me from you? Meaning from your, that some of you are saying, meaning. Uh, in one report he says, uh, I have been told that you are angry with me. Yeah? Uh, that you have something in your hearts. Uh, in the God, uh, 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 about me, meaning that you're cross with me. Then the Messenger of Allah, he says, 
alam atikum dulalan fahadakumullah wa alatan faaghnakumullah wa a'da'an faallafa Allah bayna qulubikum qalu bala wallahu wa rasuluhu amannun amannu wa afdal the message of Allah says didn't i come to you when you were dalal when you were astray and allah guided you through me were you not poor and allah enriched you through me weren't you foes between each other enemies were they not khawarij and uh, and the uh, also were fighting each other as we've seen in the story before and Allah made you love one another, put love between your hearts. Qalu bala. They all said, of course, ya, O Messenger of Allah, Allah and His Messenger, yeah, are best and most gracious. That's what the reply came. Thumma qal. Because the Prophet it seems, didn't hear a very resounding loud comeback some said this <laughs> that's why the prophet Islam, he goes Salah, say, Ala ya ansar. are you not going to answer me O oh, people of ansar are you not going to answer me Qalu. now a louder <laughs> more resounding message comes back from them Qalu. they said Bimada nujibuk, ya rasulullah Bimada. what shall we say ya messenger of allah and so amongst them, a majority who were innocent, they're thinking, you know, what's, what's going on? What should we say, O Messenger of Allah? But others know what he's talking about. So they said, what shall we, what shall we reply? How, how do we, we don't know what to say, O Messenger of Allah. Lillahi wa rasulihi al mannu wal fadl. And so they repeat it again. For surely, for Allah and His Messenger uh, is uh, are, are, are uh, gracious and uh, uh, and full of grace and bounteous for us. Then the Messenger of Allah, he carries on. He doesn't stop there still. Then he says, Amma, Amma wallahi lo shi'tum lakultum. Amma wallahi lo shi'tum lakultum. فَلَا صَدَقْتُمْ وَلَا وَلَا صُدِّقْتُمْ أَتَيْتَنَا مُكَذَّبًا فَصَدَّقْنَاكَ وَمَخْذُولًا فَنَصَدْنَاكَ وَطَرِيدًا فَآوَيْنَاكَ وَعَائِلًا فَآسَيْنَاكَ But the Messiah of Allah says, however, by Allah, if you wished, for surely you could have said, you could have said, O oh Ansar, uh, and, and you would have been truthful in saying it, and I would have testified to that truthfulness. Now he's raising now what Ansar saying Ansar you could have said this and it would have been true I would have testified to the truth instead of what I've said you could have said you came to us you came to us a messenger of God yeah after people had your people have rejected you belied you and we accepted you Sorry. and I would have been truthful yeah you came to us helpless and we helped you O messenger of God you came to us as a fugitive, homeless, and we took you in, O Messenger of God. You came to us poor, with nothing, and we comforted you, O Messenger of God. So, the Messenger of Allah is saying, you could have said all this, I'm sorry, and you would have been right in saying it. So, after, the, after saying this, can you imagine how the Ansar are feeling now? <laughs> They didn't say that, subhanAllah, but he's saying you have a right to say this. So he's praising them, isn't he? By, by rhetorically saying, you could have said this. What is he saying? He's also saying, 
the message of Allah, out of his love and kindness, he's saying, all this you did as well for me. It's true. And then he says, Are you, are you not content, O oh, Ansar, uh, actually, Yeah. Are you not content, O oh, Ansad, that the people go with sheep and camels? Yadhab al-Nasu bishati wal ba'id wa tarji'u bi Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ila rihalikum. But just before he said that, he made another statement. He says, which he mentioned in another hadith, O oh, helpers, O oh, Ansar. Do you feel anxious and agitated about the goods of this world? Wherewith I have sought to incline these people to win their hearts over to Iman, which Allah has already established in your hearts. And this is mentioned in another hadith. The Prophet is saying that what I have given of sheep and goats and worldly wealth, uh, worldly wealth yeah, to these people, is to win their hearts and those I haven't given to it's because Allah had already established Iman and love for Allah and Messenger in their hearts and in that report the Prophet ﷺ said surely those who I have given to are less loving to me than the ones who I haven't given to but they are more loving to me and here he carries on are you not content that while they go away with sheep, goat and camels, that you go back with the messenger of God back to your places? Oh, now, subhanAllah, their hearts are stirred now because they also got an answer to what they were looking for. Now it confirms to them who's going to go back with them. He's not staying with them. He's not giving them all this because Quraysh is more important loving to him. So now something stirs in their hearts of love the messenger of Allah and remember he promised them this right at Aqaba treaty they asked him oh so when we get victory over your people Ya Rasulullah are you going to go back to them and he indicated at that time that he wasn't but they thought maybe he's changed his mind so this is confirming he's saying you're going back with the messenger of Allah. And he carries on, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They've already started their hearts shaking and their eyes are already filling with tears. How much they have love for the messenger of Allah, subhanallah. And him for them. So the messenger of Allah then carries on then carries on melting their hearts so he goes surely by him in whose hands is the soul of muhammad oh. <laughs> he says i swear by allah in whose hands is my soul if it wasn't for the hijra i would have been from the i would love to be from the people of ansar if it wasn't for the Hijrah. And if people were to go in the direction of one valley and the Ansar took a different valley and route, yeah, surely I would take the route of the Ansar. I would follow you. Oh, subhanAllah. Allahum arham al-ansar. Oh Allah, have mercy on the ansar. Then he's making dua to Allah in front of them. Wa abna al-ansar and the children of ansar. Wa abna abna al-ansar and the grandchildren of the ansar. And by now everybody is crying. Oh, nobody is left. The Sahabi is reporting what their beards are not wet and they're all in tears for their love for the Messenger of Allah. And the dua. This is Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. 
Right, it shows this is Rahmatul Alameen, isn't it? Rahmatul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And uh, they're all weeping, saying, Radina bi Rasulillahi qasman wa hazan. Surely we are happy and pleased with the Messenger of Allah, with our lot and our share. They've got the best. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is going back with them. So this is the, um, uh, the, the beautiful end to the story of Ghazwat al Hunayn wa Banu Thaqif. How the Messenger of Allah makes the Ansar weep, and no doubt they were at the forefront of sacrificing themselves and their love for Allah and His Messenger. And Muhajirin with them, but Muhajirin from Quraysh. So, this is specifically to do with the, the status of the Ansar, and you see how the Messenger of Allah, how He puts it to them. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What happens is the Messenger of Allah leaves and he does Umrah on the way back to Medina. And when he goes back to Medina, he's followed on the way, in fact, to Medina. Urwa ibn Mas'ud al-Thaqafi, remember? with the leaders of Ta'if and Banu Thaqif. The same Urwa, who I mentioned before as well, who was there at the Treaty, of, just before the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. Yeah, no. This Urwa follows the Messenger of Allah. And uh, on the way back to Medina, he meets the Messenger of Allah and he embraces Islam. He embraces Islam. And this is dua of the Messenger of Allah now for Saqif starting to come true, isn't it? So the Prophet says, Son, they want to take him to Medina, but he says, No, Ya Rasulullah, give me permission to go back to my people because I want to call them to Islam. So he goes back, but he becomes Shaheed. They kill him. They kill their own leader. You know, this is Saqif uh, still at that time, certainly. Now, however, it doesn't carry on like that. For about a year or so, or, 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 or maybe less, after this, and this is after Tabuk, which is going to come next, the Ghazwat of Tabuk. What happens is that a party of uh, party from Saqif, the leaders especially, they arrive in Medina in Ramadan in the ninth year of Hijrah. Ninth year of Hijrah. This is towards the end of the eighth year, uh, the Fatu Makkah and the Ghazwa Hawazin. So in the ninth year of Hijrah after Tabuk, they turn up in Medina after the Prophet Sallallahu had come back from Tabuk. And amongst them, uh, there's five of them. Uh, Abdul uh, uh, Yali is with them. He's one of the leaders again. And they stay in the masjid. The Prophet gives them place in the masjid to stay. So this is a delegation that's come to make peace terms. Okay. Initially, they don't become Muslim, but they stay in the masjid, uh, Masjid al-Nabi, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, listening to the Qur'an and watching the believers in their prayer and what their behavior, etc. So they camped in the masjid. The mushriks still camped in the masjid. Yeah. Mushriks camped in the masjid. And then eventually, after being there some time, they all declare their Islam and become believers. So Thaqif, the dua of the Messenger of Allah came true. Oh Allah, guide Banu Thaqif and bring them to me and they came and however before they return and amongst them the youngest of them is mentioned in Sahih Muslim Abu Dawood was known as Uthman ibn Abil As and he was uh, the most the one who learned the Quran most and he was the one doing all the questioning and learned in that short time most amongst them he was the youngest amongst them learned uh, about the deen 
understanding of the deen and the Quran before he went back. Now, one of the reports is in Abu Dawud, which is mentioned as a good report, says that they wanted some leeway before they went back for in regards to Islam. They wanted that they shouldn't have to pay zakah or do jihad, as in qital, fighting, that they would be exempt from it. So the Messenger of Allah gave them exemption on this. They don't have to pay zakah, yeah, and they don't have to fight. Saying, the Messenger of Allah said, wa idha aslamu. You'll see, once they embrace Islam, yeah, they will pay the zakah and they will fight. And surely they did. I told you before, Banu Fafif, one of the fiercest, yeah, one of the, the, they were the best fighters. And that happened. They didn't wait years for them. Once, once uh, Iman entered their hearts fully and settled, that's what they did. They paid the zakah. Kind of Other things, some ahadith mentioned, which are a daif, but it's possible to, to, to see when they were asking for leniency and some uh, uh, concessions. One of the things they asked in these ahadith mentioned with, uh, reports uh, from Ibn Ishaq is that they wanted the alert. Now, this is the last shrine left of the famous goddesses. Yeah. Al Uzza is gone, Al Manat is gone, Al Lat is the last one. They wanted delay for three years before the destruction of Al Lat, their shrine. Because there's still Jahliya still there, isn't there? For this, no compromise. The Messenger of Allah said no. And in fact, he sent Abu Sufyan and Mughira ibn Shu'ba to that shrine for it to be destroyed. Yeah. Not leaving them to destroy either because they might have had some. You know, superstitions, etc., that something's going to happen to us. So they went and destroyed it, uh, uh, Abu Sufyan and Mughira ibn Shu'ba. Uh, it is also mentioned in one of these reports of Nesad that they wanted that this, uh, uh, that they, don't, they shouldn't have to pray five times a day. In one of the reports, although I say it's not authentic, but even though it's weak, there's no hukum from this. But it's possible they were having these for, for this kind of leniency. And in this report from Ibn Ishaq, even though they wanted that, Prophet Sallallahu refused and said, La khayr fi dini laysa fihi ruku. If it's true, but uh, you can see that's very likely that wouldn't have happened. He wouldn't, he wouldn't have given leniency on this. Uh, even those this statements uh, from Ibn Ishaq, that there's no good in a, in a religion where there's no ruku. Ruku means salat, basically. It's used in a metaphoric sense to mean the whole of it, the Salah. Uh, and they also, in, in some reports, mentioned that because they said their country was, place was cold, they wanted exemption from making wudu. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi refused that as well. So that is in regards to um, Banu Khafif. And I mentioned that, you should see the, the, the conclusion of the, the siege of the fortress of Taif. Yeah. And the conclusion of the dua of the Messenger of Allah when he went to Ta'if many years before and how badly they treated him. And that dua that maybe Allah will bring from their generation those who believe in La ilaha illallah. And, his, and it happened in his own lifetime, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the dua that he made despite the warfare that Tatif caused on him with, with Hawazin. Yeah. And despite that, the dua, not against them, but for them to be guided, وسلم, which came to fruition in the life of Rasulullah. Now, I thought we'd get through a lot more, but we haven't. But next time, therefore, what we will look at, inshallah, because the Messenger of Allah, when he comes back to Medina, one of the things that happens after Ghazlatul uh, uh, Hunayn. And uh, we don't have precision for it, but it's probably around the time before Tabuk. There's some indications from Hadith for it. Is his separation of the Messenger of Allah from all his wives for a month. So we will look at that uh, because there's various narratives of it. Uh, and while we're looking at that, therefore, we look at 
what I said to you from the beginning, we'll do a session completely on the wives uh, the, of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, who he married when, etc., and what they were from, etc. A little bit about them. In Sira writings, especially in uh, Tabari and Tabarani, Ibn Sa'ad, etc., there are details in regards to this. The majority of the details are not corroborated. They even have details for the story of uh, Zainab and Abu al-As, how it's painted as an amazing love story to be passed on for generations to come. No, no, I, 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 we saw this in a newsletter that was from our own mosque, actually, that this story went around, and I criticised it at that time from the, uh, for the people publishing the newsletter that this must be made clear and taken as a pinch of salt. It's not corroborated. Nice fancy story to make it look all nice, etc. Nothing in any authentic hadith. Yeah, as you can imagine, those details are not available anyway. We barely have details which are much more uh, essential. Yeah. So, again, with the wives of the Prophet, ﷺ, there are details, etc., that, uh, that we have to take with a pinch of salt. You'll find them in Sira writings. Yeah. But I'm going to try and bring out the most important aspects uh, to, to the, the uh, wives of the Prophet ﷺ, uh, including uh, in regards to uh, Maria al Kopti, Maria, uh, uh, the Copt from Egypt, and the difference of opinion in regards to whether she was the wife of the Messenger of Allah or stayed as a slave. And this is amongst the ulama themselves, there's a difference of opinion from all times. Uh, yeah, inshallah, that's for next time. Any questions what we covered today? So. No? Nothing about Khawarij that we've covered today or in the hadith of uh, distribution? Okay. Alhamdulillah, as you'll see, one of the most beautiful occasions uh, of this event of uh, Hawazin and Ghazwat uh, al-Hunayn is the last part of it to do with the Ansar and uh, their status before the Messenger of Allah and their love for the Messenger of Allah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah SWT put love in our hearts for the Messenger of Allah like that of the Ansar. And may Allah SWT increase us in Iman and uh, help us with that love to follow his guidance and his teachings that Allah SWT bestowed through him upon the world. Allahumma amin.